on this episode of the Wild Fed Podcast. Going out there, it was pretty clear. It was like, okay, I don't know how to hunt like this, but I want to learn. This is really cool. We started to drive a little bit and the canoe almost flipped itself over. We finally addressed it. There's probably like, what, 50 gallons of water in there? You like lay there in your tent thinking about all the things that could go wrong. If the boat lifts up high enough that it lifts the anchor up, then my boat could just float away. And that channel that we were camped in had never ending mackerel supply, apparently. And I like it because it's like a miniature tuna. So you're getting all of those DHA benefits and EPA benefits, those really long chain delicate lipids that are in the fish. It felt like being a castaway a little bit, but like you're a comfortable cat. You're happy to be a castaway. You're a castaway who has like food supply. Yeah. yeah. Episode 162 of the Wild Fed Podcast, Nautical Nonsense with Grant Giuliano and me, Daniel Vitalis, is brought to you by Sir Thrival. Man, I'm excited to introduce a new product at SirThrival.com. We've teamed up with Hammond's Black Walnuts, and after a year of behind-the-scenes work, I'm proud to finally introduce Sir Thrival's Black Walnut Protein Powder. This is the most exciting new product I've seen in my 15 years in the health food and nutritional supplement industry. I've been using it for over six months every morning in my smoothie and loving it more each day. It fortifies my blended drinks with 17 grams of wild protein per scoop. But the story is even more incredible because the black walnuts in our protein powder are hand foraged from wild native trees. There's no fertilizer, no irrigation, no pesticides used anywhere in the process. No agricultural land is used either. So no habitat is disrupted to produce these nuts. All the foragers are volunteers paid by the pound for their harvests. In other words, when you invest in Sir Thrival's black walnut protein powder, it's not just an investment in your health. You're investing in wild lands, wild species, healthy ecosystems, and the people who tend to them. I can honestly say it's hands down the most ethically sourced and produced protein product ever made. It's also the cleanest because we use the same ultra pure CO2 extraction process used in high end cannabis extracts. This yields a light colored raw protein powder far superior to the ones made with higher heat expeller pressing. It's a very fine flour too, so we've used it in more than just smoothies. My wife's been baking it into cookies and muffins, turning them into wild protein fortified snacks and she uses it in her oatmeal at breakfast too. I'm excited to see all the recipes you come up with using this really versatile ingredient. Wild North American native trees, 100% grown and processed in the USA. Sometimes it feels too good to be true. We've managed to bring a wild hand foraged native North American food to people in a format they can easily use to fortify their diets daily. Head over to SirThrival.com to check out the entire product line and use the coupon code WILDFED to get an additional 5% off your order. Sir Thrival's Black Walnut Protein Powder, the first wild protein powder on the market ever. Do you need an antidote to the metaverse? We just launched our newest t-shirt design over at wild-fed.com. It features our antidote to the metaverse tagline on the chest, a wild fed badge on the sleeve, and two tarot style cards juxtaposed on the back, one modeled on the tarot card known as the fool, who's wearing an oculus and absentmindedly walking off the roof of a building with a bag of fast food in one hand and a cell phone in the other. Next to it is a card based on the magician who's juggling four implements, a fishing rod, a rifle, a trap, and a foraging basket. It represents our belief that a life that includes the outdoors inoculates you against believing that an artificial experience of life could ever replace a natural one. You see, for us, being wild-fed, hunting, fishing, and foraging is about a lot more than just getting our groceries. It's an antidote to the metaverse, an act of rebellion against the transhuman agenda that is leading humanity to abandon the natural world in favor of wearing screens over their eyes to live in a virtual one. We choose the natural over the artificial. We choose an antidote to the metaverse. We choose to be fed by the wild. Check out our new shirt at wild-fed.com. I'm Daniel Vitalis, and you're listening to The Wild Fed Podcast a show about reconnecting with nature through hunting, fishing, foraging, and food. Wild Fed. Food is all around you. Every once in a while, it's 
fun to take a break from interviewing just to have a conversation with our producer and editor, Grant Giuliano, musing, rambling, and recounting our recent adventures and shenanigans. If you're new to the show, maybe go back an episode to hear our more typical format. Otherwise, behold the obnoxious characters who bring you these shows each week as they sound when not speaking to their betters. Here in Maine, we are beginning the descent into winter, which I'm pretty excited about. I'm going to get some much needed catch up time at home. The ice fishing season will start soon, and I can put the finishing touches on season three of the Wild Fed TV show before it goes to air. We still have a little bit of filming left for season three of Wild Fed, and everything is on track for a season four. So if all goes as planned, we'll jump right back into filming again this coming spring. We still have time for your TV episode ideas. So please write us at info at wild-fed.com or on our social media to plant the seeds of future episodes you'd like to see, host, or even be a part of. And in the meantime, I just want to thank you again for all your support. It means the world to us to have such a wonderful audience for the content we produce so thank you for tuning in here for the podcast and on the outdoor channel or amazon prime for the tv show and of course we'll be back next week with another interview covering the kinds of wild food and ecological literacy topics we love to feature here hey daniel hey grant how's it going buddy good man i'm excited to do a little solo behind the scenes episode again been a little while i like doing these so many things have happened uh, some things didn't happen. Neither of you, or I, neither you or I shot a deer. No, I didn't fall. put enough work in. I didn't put any work in. I went and sat in my stands a couple times. But... After uh, sitting for those days while we were filming out on the island, yeah, it was enough. <laughs> it's funny because uh, for like the average person I know around here, their hunting is obviously limited to the typical hunting seasons, and that's typically going to be white-tailed deer is going to be the main focus. Mm-hmm. And uh, so everybody all through November is like talking about hunting. Yeah. And we've just come off of, you know, six months of production. Right. And it's like, I don't want to talk about hunting for a couple of, <laughs> for like a month. I wanted to like sit around the house in my sweatpants. I wanted to train. I wanted to like rehydrate and feed myself right. and catch up on sleep. And, and so it's, when hunting season came around, it was almost like a little stressful. It was like, oh, because I obviously do want to go out and hunt. But uh, at the same time, it was like I kind of wanted a little bit of a break. And then we're about to jump into, you know, working on our season, season four production. Right. Which means going back to, you know, hunting under that kind of pressure of having, you know, to produce results and produce episodes. So anyway, um, I kind of took it pretty light, as did you. Yeah. I I probably could have put a little bit. I definitely could have put more in. There's a lot of mornings where I just was like, uh, I'll go in this afternoon, you know? I'll I was go, just I'll hoping to get afternoon. lucky is really yeah. what I was doing. Um, a big thing for me, too, is getting overwhelmed because I'm never ready, you know? <laughs> like, <laughs> hunting season came up, and then I think it had already st- one week passed, and I still hadn't sighted in my rifle. So I was like, oh, I can't go out. I can't go out if I haven't sighted in my rifle. It's probably okay. Maybe it's okay from last year. Then you go to the range and then shoot. I go to the range. Like, it's not okay. It's not okay, but now it is. <laughs> yeah. So then, yeah. Then it's like I never, I never scouted because I was busy before mm-hmm. the season came up. So it's like then when I'm sitting, I like found a blind, a ground blind in the woods that I was hunting at. <clears throat> when I'm sitting there, I'm like, I don't know if there's anything here because mm-hmm. like I'm rushing to get to the stand yeah. before the sun rises, or I'm rushing to get to the stand before. It gets too right, late. So you haven't done any scouting. So I haven't really scouted the yeah. area. You're like maybe at a dead spot. Yeah, <laughs> you just don't know. It seems good, but I just, yeah, you just don't know. It was interesting for me also having not done much scouting, but hunting on my own land here. And you'd think like, oh, it's your land, like you must know it so good. But it's like we were gone all yeah. for six months, you know. So what was happening here, I wasn't really sure. And then we got that little dusting of snow. It's just so I re- helpful. I really should have taken advantage of it. Did you go out that day? Uh, I didn't hunt that day, but I went and looked at tracks yeah. you know, and scouted, and it was like very helpful to see how the deer were using the land this year and everything. So, uh, A lot of people got their deer this year, though. Yeah. Uh, and, you know, in light of the episode we put out um, recently uh, with Baron Blossy. The podcast episode, yeah. Yeah. Um, which was such a great episode. So for people listening, if you haven't heard that one yet, it's called Too Many Deer, Too Many Earthworms. Man, that was one of the more powerful mm, paradigm shifting episodes with regard to wildlife conservation that we've done because 
he really just kind of lays out how deleterious deer are on the landscape when their populations exceed the carrying capacity and how we've long ago exceeded that carrying capacity in so much of the country, but we we don't realize it because we manage for hunting opportunities. Mm-hmm. It makes you realize that because you're because you realize okay, hunters have funded conservation, therefore conservation has been skewed toward the needs of hunters, which typically is good deer hunting opportunities. You know, even if you don't harvest a deer, you know, you want to see deer or feel like you can harvest one, you know, you got to feel like it's worth it or you're not going to buy a license. You're not going to participate. So then we manage for all of these deer at the expense of the ecosystem. Cause it's kind of like if you managed just for a high population of people, it's like, look what you get, right. Mm-hmm. You get like these cities that just sort of wipe out everything around them. So similarly, like we've got all these deer on the landscape in so many places now. And of course there's people listening to this in places where that's not the case, but I thought Maine had this really small deer herd. Right. So and now I realize that even here our deer herd's probably a little too big. And that's changed how I feel about the number of tags being issued. And I guess to your point about a lot of people harvesting this year and a lot of tags were given out. And then this being the first year Maine's sold doe tags as well. Um, and I thought, oh, wow, they're because because they sent out that celebratory celebratory. I like, <laughs> I I like say saying celebratory. Yeah, I like saying celebratory. <laughs> I don't I think it's the same meaning. Um, banana, banana, <laughs> celebratory email saying that they'd sold 60,000 tags. And I was like, oh, no, like, what are they doing? And now I'm like, oh, they're knocking the deer back because of the impact they have on particularly on native plant. Yeah, before I heard that podcast, I uh, I thought that state was just trying to get more revenue. Yeah, kind of too. being irresponsible. Yeah, I was worried it was leading to being irresponsible. But uh, you know, all that said, um, we're headed into two more hunts for the show this mm-hmm. month, which is exciting. So we've got our snowshoe hare hunt coming, and which uh, I've never been a part of before. I've never seen. Yeah, I haven't. Uh, you know, I mean, I've I've hunted them with like a twenty two walking through the woods. Mm-hmm but I haven't gone out with beagles before. So. Right. Yeah, I've even seen hair in the woods. I've just never seen the hunt. Yeah. So I'm pretty excited about that. And our friend, Tony Seacrest coming up, who's yeah. done this podcast a bunch of times. And mm-hmm. uh, I think he's cooked on the wild fed TV show more than any other chef that we've had. I think right? he's done three, three episodes. episodes. Yeah. So this would be his fourth. Yeah. So he's coming great. up and we're heading into Northern Maine. And then right after we roll into sea ducks. Yeah. I love that. No, oh, I can't wait. It's going to be fun to tell that story. Yeah. Especially yeah. because of the kooky twins. Yeah, exactly. The twins, Mark and Matt. Uh, I'm, I went to buy shotgun ammo recently, and somebody stole it out of my cart. Come on, Cabela's. really? I didn't tell you that story. No. I'm assuming before you paid for yeah, it. Yeah, I, I, like, I, I went and I found, you know, because it's just kind of slim pickings. And then this time of year, everybody's buying for, for that too. So so I was, you know, specifically looking for... Um, like number seven high brass 12 gauge yeah and um put it put like six boxes in the cart and then i go over to like the area where all the cooking stuff like the meat grinders and all that kind of like food supply stuff is and then i come back and my cart's gone <laughs> your whole cart my cart's just gone and some guy had been like stalking me a little bit in the ammo department like Did you i take felt all like he it? wanted my ammo i went back and i was able to get two boxes uh. so i was hoping to get six boxes now i have two so we're going to have to come up with a little more for this hunt. Okay. Yeah. Are prices still really high? They're coming down. Yeah. Things are normalizing a little bit. Yeah. Yeah. But I don't think they're ever going to be the same. Right. You know. Um, also, I got my uh, swordfish bill back in yeah, the mail. Yeah, so That looks nice. Yeah. I want to clean it up a little bit with some hydrogen peroxide, whiten it up a little bit. But uh, Austin Enser, if you're listening to this, thanks, Captain, for uh, getting this back to me. Uh, we had got our swordfish down there. So we, we had had a quite a like a cooler load of fish and we just could not fit this thing <laughs> anywhere and it was it had a lot of meat and oil right it was yeah. pretty nasty so we we're trying to convince you to tape it to the roof of the car you're like, like it's going to be so disgusting yeah, by the time we get there's back no way so austin said you know what tie a piece of cord to it drop it down into the ocean off the you know into the salt water off the pier at my house and i'll i'll get it to you so it's i like that it's finally here so i'm pretty excited about it um just in time for christmas you feeling that yuletide glow right now yeah i always am i'm so into it it's december 1st so we can start playing christmas music yeah i started last week <laughs> i'm sure vani pushed it pretty hard she did but i had i had i had been like no 
I condemned it. We were not doing it. And then I I went around her. I went around her and went to her mom and texted her mom in Canada and said, "Yeah, we're not going to start celebrating till December 1st." And she was like, "That's great. I'm on board with you guys." And then one night Avani's like, "Cuz that's always been my thing. We start December 1st. Like, let's not ruin Thanksgiving. Let's not get too into Christmas yet. Like I get a little tired of those songs by the 25th, you know? <laughs> so I was like, I was like, you know, we start on December 1st. Always been the rule. But then she always tries to shift it and go, no, no, it starts on November 25th. So we have a full month. And I was like, no, no, no. She's like, yeah, that's what we always do. I was like, really? And I show her the text with her mom. <laughs> it's like, yeah, we're all on board for December, for December 1st. But I was thinking, and I wanted to talk a little bit about this. I think probably the best, aspect of christmas is the crooning <laughs> don't you think no <laughs> you don't think i'm not a big fan of crooning it doesn't come around very yeah you are a huge fan i like of to crooning. joke about crooning i like to joke about it yeah <laughs> <laughs> i love it man there's so many like sinatra type songs that that come on i was listening to one the other day we we listen to it all the time but i never really thought like until just yesterday or two days ago i was like oh this is female crooning because most of the crooners, right? They're all dudes. I've never even seen her a female. I think crooner. you have. If I do this one for you, okay. it, it starts off. It's like, it's like, old Mister Kringle is sure gonna jingle, singing yeah. yeah. all yeah. your jingles away. Yeah. <laughs> Everybody's waiting for the man with the bag. Yeah, that's pretty croony. That's pretty croony, man. <laughs> it's definitely a crooner. But yeah, I'm excited for. Uh, we we got our tree the other day, so we cut down like a. This is gonna shock and appall some people but we've probably cut down a 50 foot balsam <laughs> it's such a big tree and uh i mean they're so thick back there so it's like mm-hmm. yeah you have a yeah, lot it's of like trees zero right impact but anyway yeah cut down this really really tall tree kept the top 15 feet of it <laughs> and uh it's so nice because now we have two dogs like um with diaz here and uh before it would be like ellie's bed and then we could have a pretty wide tree, mm-hmm. but now in that space with two dogs, I need, I was like, I need a narrower tree. So when uh, I get yeah. in the top, it's like a, it's like a really full, but very narrow tree. And mm-hmm. I really like the way that looks. So it makes such a big difference to have a tree in the house. Oh my gosh. It makes it feel so nice. I, f- I have this, I mean, I can't like, this is just an anecdote that I, it's like a felt experience, but I feel like my house plants benefit from being around the tree. Yeah, they're like, oh, what's it like out there? <laughs> <laughs> I get the impression that it's like, you know, like if you were uh, hanging out at a party or something and a, and a guy walked in who was like super yoked and you'd kind of like maybe, pu- you know, like <laughs> stand up a little straighter and puff your chest a little bit. That's what I feel like my house plants do. They're like, whoa, okay. Like, I love that. Time to green up a little bit. <laughs> That's so good. Uh, there's a kids movie that needs to be written about that. <laughs> um, do we ever think about putting lights on your tree? I feel like that's one of the most dangerous ideas. That's what I said to Kendall. Who, we like, still did it, but I, I think as long as you keep your tree watered, you should be okay. And nowadays the lights are LED, so they don't get too hot. I don't buy the LEDs. I I like dig and dig and dig till I like find incandescent. the incandescence. Yeah, such a nicer light quality. Way better light quality. Yeah, that frequency of light's so warm. Mm-hmm. When they try to replicate that with LEDs, I'm it, used to it now. It's but it's not the same, man. No, it's definitely it's that flicker rate that they have. You know, like if you were to film that, I think I'm using LED now. I just got a little you, nervous. Yeah, <laughs> <laughs> they're on right now. <laughs> oh no, will you leave your lights on. I did. I did. I'm just I know, remembering. I, I, we we just never do that. The ones that I just bought, because it was it was like night. I like the white lights too. I don't I don't like the green cords and fixtures, mm-hmm. and I don't like the multicolored ones. I like just the straight white cord, white fixture, clear bulbs. And uh, but yeah, wrapping those around like a resinous, mm-hmm. dried out tree, mm-hmm. and then like leaving the house <laughs> just seems like a real, especially with the incandescence, because you've got like an anode and a cathode with yes. like a charge running yeah. between them. It's like you could probably light a cigarette off of that. Yeah. Like you probably don't want to. I know. Stick that on a, a resinous conifer. <laughs> Very flammable tree. <laughs> but it looks so pretty. It so. looks so pretty. Um, I wanted to talk today a little bit about our uh, trip to the island. I think that was such a... I want to go back. Yeah. It was really nice, huh? Yeah, it was awesome. We had gotten contacted Daniel's by... Daniel's gazing it. into my eyes right now. Yeah, well, <laughs> that was a lot of quality time we had out there, it was. wasn't it? Yeah. We were, it was, How many trips did we do? Three? 
I we did, did that. We initially went scouting. Yeah, then we went back to like, hunt, and then we went back. A well, no, no, we went hunting twice, and yeah. then we went back another time for pickups. For pickups, yeah. So four times. Yeah. Wow. Yeah, we got contacted by a land trust um, outside of Stonington, Maine. There's so many islands off the coast, and if you're the if Maine, you've never been to Maine, you Maine Island Heritage Land Trust. Yeah, Maine, yeah, the Island Heritage Land Trust. Yeah. Um, if you haven't been to Maine, but you might be familiar with um, Acadia, it seems like a lot of people are like, "Oh, I'll say I'm from Maine." And people used to say different things. Like people would be like, "Oh, Kenny Bunk." I don't know if that was because Bush was in office for a oh, long probably, time and everybody yeah. knew about Kenny Bunk. And the, or people would be like, Bangor, Stephen King, mm-hmm. <laughs> you know, lobsters. Now it seems like everybody knows about Acadia for some reason. Mm-hmm. Um, but Stonington is just south of Acadia. And so that whole island, you know, all the islands off that coast, um, they, they there's deer there. Yeah. They swim between the islands. Yep. And so we were contacted by the... Uh, main island heritage trust and they told us that we could hunt up there and and we went to give it a whack you'll have to watch the The episode episode to know what happened but logistically i just wanted to talk about what it took for us to get out there because that was really different than anything we had done before i think i had a slightly different experience than you because it's your boat you know, mm-hmm. and you're doing all the well, nabbing we, we and stuff. We clearly did on like the trip lot. out there when you would try to tell me which way to go. And I'd I like, didn't oh. try to tell you. I said, I don't know which way. <laughs> well, okay, there was one time I tried to tell <laughs> well, I was just like, I thought it's over there. You're like, Grant, we've done this four times. <laughs> it's right there. Uh, <clears throat> this was only, but it was only like two miles offshore. Yeah, it wasn't far, but it's just like we have so much gear, all my film gear, your hunting gear. And some of that stuff is pretty sen- in the blue eddy electric generator. It's like pretty sensitive equipment that we have to haul up there. There's a canoe. Plus, plus there's all the camping equipment there's and all the equipment. food yeah. and the firewood. Yep. And I mean, just on and on and on. So we're trailering Daniel's uh, 22 foot? 20 foot. 20 foot Alaskan Lund, like three hours up with a canoe either inside of it or on the roof of his truck. <laughs> yes, it'd be like with the all SJ, this gear that we're talking with a about. canoe on top with a boat behind it. And then the boat's full of gear and the truck's full of gear. Yeah. And then everything in dry bags. And then like the last two trips we went up, there was no dock when we got up there. So we had to like, last time we had to like climb under the pilings. Yes, that's true. Cause Stonington's got a huge working waterfront, but then the public boat launch is pretty small and you got to weave your boat through some buildings. It's very awkward to put in there. And then, um, like you said, the last couple of trips up there, they had pulled the dock out. So then we, we had to do some wild stuff to yeah, kind of just figure it out, figure it out. But we'd put the boat in and then I'd drive the boat over to another dock, leave the truck there. Then I'd tie the boat up. Then you'd run around like the block and come down onto the boat. And then I would run back around the block to move the truck. And then we'd, I'd run all the way back around the block to drop down onto the boat again. Yeah. And then we'd head off. But that last one where we had to like climb under the pilings all over the barnacle rocks. <laughs> it was fun though. Trying to get into the boat. Yeah. You know, like parking in a place where you're like, can I leave my truck here? Yeah. I'm just going to do it. And then going off off uh, to the islands. And so we hunted one island and we camped on another island. And the camping portion was... Pretty serene. Pretty awesome. Yeah. Man. It felt like being a castaway a little bit. But yeah. like... A comfortable cat. You're happy to be a castaway. You're a castaway who has like food supplies. Yeah. yeah. But we, uh, yeah, we would camp on this island that was probably, what do you think that island was like 25 acres or something? I don't know. Yeah. How much is, how much is the one we hunted on? Like 40. Yeah. Something. So I'd say probably about 20. It was a really small island. Nothing else on it. No people on it. I mean, no. it's just, we'd, when you'd hear there, other boats going through. There was a raccoon on it. There was finally a raccoon. figured out. We found the raccoon. <laughs> there was, um, and there's also, out on Isla Ho, every 15 seconds is that. That's a good, good impression of it. <laughs> it's it's so on. weird because you could not notice it for hours and then all of a sudden your brain tunes into it and then it almost is like annoying. I liked it. Uh, man. Like, I noticed, Walker said he loved it too. We'd be in the you're tent like, at night, you're that? asleep and like I'm just laying there with my eyes open like, <laughs> and then I'd just be like, one, two, <laughs> three, four. <laughs> 15 wow <laughs> it's cool yeah. though it's cool it to cool. be up there uh there's so little people but it's a working waterfront all yeah. those fishermen going by lobstermen primarily yeah, and so the right. water is just all the channels are filled with buoys that go down to lobster pots and so driving the boat through there you have to be pretty careful not to get your prop caught up in all the lobster pots but we would 
need to get to the island that we were hunting, which was only like a 10 minute little boat ride, not even, but, but we'd have to do it in the dark to get there early enough to get into the tree stands. Towing the canoe. Yeah. Towing a canoe so that we could then anchor the boat off of the island, offshore of the island, and then paddle the canoe into the island. Difficult, sneak up difficult to the tree to, stands. Yeah. Difficult to tell that part of the story for, as, for me as a camera guy. Just because it's, there's so much involved, you know, it couldn't really be filming during that time. Oh, right. You know, hopefully that came across. And it was dark. Yeah, and it was pitch black. And then we'd use night vision goggles because, you know, you'd need to be able to see the lobster pot. So even though you have navigational lights, they don't light up the They just allow other boats to see you. And then um, and then we'd either have to tie the, the canoe to the side of the boat or we'd pull it into the boat. But if we pulled it into the boat... It was a lot louder to get, yeah, when we to like it slide it out. And so you're, you're on this, like, you're just a couple hundred yards off of a 46 acre island. So it's pretty small mm-hmm. and it's dark and it's before all the bustle of all the lobstermen starts in the morning. So any noise you make, like dropping anchor, pulling mm-hmm. an anchor, pulling out a canoe, you're like, man, those deer are going to hear all this noise. Cause after a while the joke was like, as if they don't hear us like pull up. Then a Hopefully chain they're... anchor. Yeah. Then they hear splash of the canoe. Then they hear two guys like, <laughs> <laughs> and then no, right here, there, <laughs> and then us like paddling, <laughs> <laughs> and then the canoe hitting the beach, <laughs> and then me having to carry the canoe up to the shoreline, <laughs> <laughs> and then we sneak all quiet into the tree stand. <laughs> it's really funny, but. Um, that whole thing, though, like just the amount of, of work it took from when we'd wake up in the tents to where we were in the tree stand mm-hmm. was like more difficult than, you know, what I would typically do to like go from here to New York City or something. Right, right. You know, more logistically challenging. We found we saw that other tree stand while we were out there. I wonder what that guy's process was like. Yeah, how he was getting <laughs> yeah. in and out. I bet he wasn't liked, using a canoe. I think I, he's using a dinghy. I liked your like thought process on that. You were like... You know, I've been like hating this guy. Like we're just sitting in the <laughs> we're sitting in the tree stand. You're like I've been like hating this guy who has a tree stand here because he has a tree stand here. But he's probably a really cool guy. <laughs> yeah, to have a tree stand yeah. here. Yeah, you've got to you've got to take it a little further than most people are willing to yeah. take it. <laughs> yeah, going out there, I felt I, it was pretty clear. It was like, okay, I don't know how to hunt like this, but I want to learn. This is really <laughs> cool. The first day we got out there to hunt uh, to set up the tree stand. We were like, I was filming you. I was like, all right, Daniel, tell us like what we're about to do and what we're doing. And you, you, you're like, okay, so wait, what was that? Did you hear that? It sounds like to somebody on the other. sounds like kids. And then dad yeah. and two kids just walk. <laughs> <laughs> walk fast. And we're like, hey, guys, how you doing? Oh, man. And we're just like, oh, I, I yeah. could have. I. <laughs> <laughs> I could have really used my kindness muscle a lot more that day. You were really good, actually, with that Not guy. Not that good. That guy you were. There was another guy later that you weren't. I was refused you to kind of, You just kind of ignored him. Yeah, yeah thank you but for that. That, that guy, about that. he was like, what are you guys up to? And you're like, we're actually... We're fat. You kept whispering to him, and he's talking to you. And I was whispering voice. to him to try to be like, follow what I'm yeah. doing. <laughs> Eventually, you but, also whisper. I liked that guy. But actually. understand now where he was coming from, because we didn't know at the time. So we're on this island... And we had been told, yeah, this would be a really, because there's several islands, you know, that we could have been hunting. And, and we were told, hey, this is the one where we've seen the most deer and this is probably the best one to go to. They didn't realize that come hunting season, that tall ships were still landing there, like big old pirate ship yeah. looking, you know, schooners. They're, they're landing there and then they're ferrying all of these people onto the island. Like and then people having clam bake. They're doing a big lobster bakes. clam bake on the other side of the island. So, and then they would all get out and walk over the circumference of the island. So we were in there first setting up our tree stand when we, we meet the dad and the kids and then it's like, oh, and then like, there's the, the mom and then there's like other people coming and then we start like, to canoe many, back to my how boat. How many of you are there? It's like 20, 30, I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> we'll be here until five eating dinner. Yeah, I was like, how long you guys plan to be here? Oh, just a couple more hours. We're going to have a clam bake. I was like, oh no. Oh no. We had come that far and we were like, I, we have to just set up the tree stand anyway. Yeah, we're doing it. We're committed. But there was so much deer sign that day. There was a lot of deer sign that there day. There was so much. And moose sign too. 
Well, yeah. I have not seen a deer swimming between the islands. That I would remember, really like remember to when see. we left that one day and we saw those deer? Like we were on mainland, we we're driving, and we saw them coming up out of the ocean. Yeah, and we we're like, "You sons of guns!" <laughs> <laughs> yeah. How about the day? So we had gone back because we were so busy with all of those logistics. Like you said, you didn't get to just purely do cinema cinematography. You. um also had to like i was you know, pulling anchor pulling anchor dropping I was, anchor <laughs> i was learning how to paddle a canoe yeah, you learned how to paddle a canoe <laughs> just for people like listening to it's like ooh, paddling canoe getting out of your boat on the ocean into a canoe full of gear like 50 pounds of gear yeah and like and more. maybe fifty thousand dollars worth of gear yeah. too you know because you've got all the camera equipment and lenses <laughs> and batteries our bluetti, the hunting gear, like stuff that can't get in the salt water. Yeah. So you load the, and you're, and you're like, how many trips do we want to do? So yeah. it's like, all right, let's pack the canoe as much as we feel is like remotely and safe. Making the canoe heavy makes it harder to steer. Much harder to paddle and steer. And then you have waves. And so it's not just, it's yeah, not sketchy. just like you're on coming, a lake. Yeah. Coming to the side of the boat. You that know? Want, yeah. You're side to, to the, waves. to the surf. And then that's trying to drive you into the rocks as you try to find your landing spot. And so we'd have to paddle Remember a couple first, hundred yards. That first time we had all the equipment in there and I was like, you had me in the back to steer. I don't really know how to steer a canoe. And then you were like, like we got into like a big argument. You're like, just do, like basically you were like, just do better. <laughs> like you, we're going the wrong way. And then, then, paddling and, us and, then it was like, and it was like, dude, look at all this cool bioluminescence. <laughs> that was like the next line. I was like, yeah, that's real fucking cool. <laughs> we're in the, so yeah, it's dark. You're trying to paddle a canoe. I would wear the night vision, but Grant, when he's filming, he's wearing a set of monitors over his ears a lot of times. So even in a situation like that, they're around your neck. Like you look like you've got Beats by Dre on or something, yeah, yeah. you know? And so you've got all a that. A too much electronics. Yeah, you've to, got a lot of gear to manage. Yeah. So throwing the night vision on is a little much. So I was the only one wearing the night vision. And so why I'd want to be in the front of the boat so I can see in Navis. And... uh yeah, I forget. Oh yeah, so the so we're paddling in the dark, and then you know you'd paddle and it just send a cascade of bioluminescence so cool. off. So I mean, cool. it was incredible, right? It's just funny how fast we can go from like bickering with each other, yeah, like, to like really that's beautiful. really cool, <laughs> asshole. <laughs> <laughs> oh man, but setting up that camp was so sweet. Just yeah. like being there, you know, waking up to the because the waves were like lapping up at high tide, mm -hmm. ten feet from the tent. And yeah, we just sit there at night, and I man. What I learned, I learned a lot on that trip because, you know, my boating experience is, is fairly, is, I'm a, a, quite a novice really. And, mm -hmm. um, so anchoring a boat is one thing, but anchoring a boat and then being like, I'll come back in the next day and it'll still be here. Yeah. <laughs> that you, part's sketchy. You got up a lot that first night. Oh man. The whole time. Not even the first night, just like every night mm -hmm. after towards the end of the trips, like I stopped being so concerned. I started to feel more confident. But you like lay there in your tent thinking about all the things that could go wrong with the anchor. Because you imagine, okay, what if I haven't put out enough anchor lines? I don't have enough scope, they call that. So what if the... what if Because the, you look at our tide charts. Like you and I spent a lot of time looking at the tide charts that, that those weeks. And, you know, you'd be like, okay, tonight's high tide is eight feet, but three days from now, it's like an 11 foot tide. Mm. So you're like, okay, if the boat lifts up high enough that that anchor comes up, that it lifts the anchor up, Mm -hmm. then my boat could just float away. If it goes into a deeper part of the channel where that anchor doesn't ever make contact with the bottom. I was thinking a lot about that. But then as the trip went on, I started to imagine the friction in the, on the side of the boat. Cause you know, the anchor lines on the cleat at the bow, but the boat is moving so much, you know, and one tide, the boat's way over here. The next tide, the boat's way over here. So imagining that rope giving way. And then there's nothing, just nothing connected to the boat. The boat just goes adrift. And so you just start imagining all these scenarios. And that means basically I'm up every hour getting out of the tent, either going out with the night vision or a flashlight, just trying to like find my boat. Mm -hmm. And always like, you can imagine almost every time you get out there and have like a moment of panic till you find it, you yeah. know, for a second, you're like, it's gone. Oh, there it is. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> oh, super freaky. Yeah. But, I, but you know, that it worked my, you know, we had to anchor a lot. Mm -hmm. So it really like, a built, lot of repetition. Built that muscle, you know. I feel like a lot more confident. Also, just getting in it, getting in and out, putting in and, and taking the boat out when there's no dock mm -hmm. was good. That was good practice as well. It's doable. 
Yeah, and that's what happens with the sea ducks, because by the time we go down to sea duck hunt in, you know, we'll start right around Christmas this year, or probably right around the solstice, mm -hmm. week of the 20th or so. Um, yeah, they pull all the docks out where we put in down in Scarborough, and uh, yeah, you just like kind of drop in the boat in off the ramp into the water, and somebody holds on to it, and everybody mm -hmm. jumps in, and same kind of thing coming back. So, you know, it's good practice. Yeah, very you know? good. I mean, I'm sure it's like not a big deal to people who've boated a long time, but... You know, in the beginning, it was like just figuring out how to move a trailer. Mm -hmm. I'd be so sketched out. So also, that was like a long, that was a pretty long drive. Yeah. I typically drive Three like hours. about about an hour to get down to where we fish in the summer. So and where we sea duck hunt. But yeah, going three hours with the boat was a little different through a lot of towns and a lot of traffic. And mm -hmm. So yeah, it really built the skill set. So I'm re I'm really grateful for yeah. that trip. That's awesome. Yeah. And I love having the ocean as a giant shower, bathtub slash toilet. So nice. <laughs> it was like, your skin is so nice by the time you leave. Yeah. Yeah. Your skin is just lovely. It's like a spa. <laughs> it is like a spa. Um, but there was that one night where we were, we were there to film pickup. So we were, so I guess for the, those are not in the industry, you know, so you get done shooting something for a show. And then sometimes it's like, especially with this, because Grant was, this is where I was initially saying, he's so busy with all these other aspects of the hunt itself that he's not having the time or I guess the artistic bandwidth to, and there's not like the sunlight for it either. Cause we'd be in the tree stand for 10 hours a day. Yeah. So it's like, you'd go out, it's dark, climb up the tree in the dark, come down in the dark. There's not as much well. time to like get the story. Right. You know? So we got to go film pickups. Like that might be beautiful B roll of a, of old lobster, pot rope like on oh, the should beach I, should i got that you didn't get that uh, on the beach i did you did good, oh, good man <laughs> uh, yeah like some beach grass blowing in the wind yeah. those kind of things or you want to just get a little bit more of the story all the pieces you need to like fill in yeah. the episode so we went back up but the weather was terrible well it was it wasn't it was just got windy and the surf the was, chop was yeah. bad though yeah. and then we so we wanted to film a scene of we just wanted a little b-roll of me paddling out with the night vision on from the sh the camp oh my God, to the boat that. and that was so sketchy we'll get back to the show in a moment but first hunting is as ancient as humanity itself and through most of our history it wasn't just a physical pursuit it was a spiritual one one of the ways that human beings came to understand ourselves and our place in the wild world that sustained us Hunting is still an incredible tool for personal transformation today, helping you discover more about yourself, your environment, the animals you share the world with, and even helping you to develop a deeper understanding of life and death itself. Hunting can help you find your place in the community of life. But you could hunt all your life and never find that kind of transformation. It takes deliberate practice, awareness, and sometimes initiation. That's why my friend Monsal Dent created Sacred Hunting. Sacred hunting brings new or even experienced hunters out onto the landscape to stock, harvest, and field dress animals in a retreat-type setting. In conjunction with sweat lodges, entheogenic plant medicine ceremonies, and strong intention setting that prepares hunters for a lifelong spiritual relationship with themselves, the land, and the animals they hunt. If you want to hunt as a tool for transformation, check out Sacred Hunting. Monsell and his team will guide you through beginner hunts and more experienced hunters will find unique opportunities available across the country and globe. There's only a few spots available for each hunt, so go to sacredhunting.com and complete their two-minute application. Discounts are available if you let them know you heard about them on the Wild Fit Podcast. Again, go to sacredhunting.com and to learn more about Monsell and Sacred Hunting, check out episode 135 of the Wild Fit Podcast. Now, back to the show. So we... we paddle out to the boat and we get there but at within a couple minutes things start getting really out of control and we've tied the the canoe to the side of the boat because we didn't want to pull it into the boat because Which we've it been takes doing up. we had been doing that we've been doing that a lot but one issue we had is if we tied if we tethered the canoe to the side of the boat so the boat's 20 feet long and the the canoe is probably like 11 12 feet long or something mm -hmm. like that so tie that to the side of the boat kind of like a sidecar on a motor, old yeah. motorcycle or something. Yeah. But when we would get where we were going, there'd always be some water in the canoe and yeah, then we'd have to, to bail, bail that out. out. Um, but we were like, okay, it's worth de dealing with today because we don't want the boat. We don't want the canoe in the boat so we can film because otherwise it's going to be hard to film yeah. with this canoe takes up the whole inside of the boat. <clears throat> so it's dark. The chops really bad. The wind's really bad. We pull anchor and now the boat's just being blown 
all around. And the boat, uh, the canoe, uh, well, well, as it's being spun around, the canoe starts taking on well, water. Because we started to drive a little bit, yeah. and the canoe almost like flipped itself over. Okay. And like we almost lost the canoe. Well, now there's, there's I can't. Like, I have a very limited field of view, yeah. so even with binocular night vision, you can imagine if you put two toilet paper tubes over your eyes you have a pretty limited field of view compared mm-hmm. to what you're used to seeing. So yeah, I couldn't see that happening at yeah. first. Right. And, and then it just, I looked I over. Like, Daniel, Daniel, and you kept driving because I, cause you couldn't see it. And then when you, we finally addressed it, there's probably like, what, 50 gallons of water in there? More than that. You think so? You were bailing with a five-gallon bucket and making no headway. Yeah, that was scary. I mean, there had to have been... 150 gallons of water in there. I wouldn't even be surprised if that was 200 gallons of water. Or just in a, in a matter of seconds, it just filled up the canoe. So now it's like, like, is there a hole in the canoe? Yeah. And then if the canoe, cause then it was like, well, if the canoe painters, the ropes on the bow and the stern, if they break or the cleats on the boat break, we're going to lose the canoe and it's going to sink. Mm-hmm. And then we can't get back to our beach where we're camped and all our gear is. Yeah. So it's not like uh, what's the, it's like, what's the big deal? It's like, it's nighttime conditions are really bad. We can't get to camp without this canoe. So at this point we've got the anchor up, but there's buoys everywhere. I'm trying to stay out of the buoys. You're trying to bail with that little like cut off bleach bottle. Mm-hmm. And then I'm, I'm like, it's not going fast enough. Cause it just felt like I'm watching you bail and no waters. It's just, you're not making any headway. Yeah. And then I was like, Oh, switch, use this five gallon bucket. Cause we had that, yeah. that nice five gallon bucket. We were bleeding the mackerel in. Mm-hmm. So I give you that bucket. And even that you're taking like probably four gallon scoops. Mm-hmm. And I remember it was really hard for you to figure out where to pour the water yeah. because you couldn't reach out the four gallons of water. Yeah. That's what, 16, 32 pounds, probably 35 pounds of water. You can't get that out over the canoe. So you're trying to pour it between the canoe and the boat, but then half of it's going back <laughs> in the canoe. And uh, man, the boat was spinning around and I'm, I'm looking through those two toilet paper tubes. And as we spin, I'm losing track of which island we're camped on, which island we're hunting on, and which island is the island across the channel, because we just kept spinning in circles. And we could, I mean, it was like a panic moment, huh? That got really sketchy for a second. And then I remember we we got that settled. And we were like, you know what? We're not, (laughs) we're just dropping the anchor again, and we're just going to chill. Because I remember being like, I just need to sit here a second, dude. Like, that got really panicky. And then I remember also... The last morning when we left, it was pretty bad. Yeah. And we still had to canoe back into the shore after that yeah, whole... Yeah, yeah, exactly. In the dark. It ended up being pretty smooth, actually. That wasn't too bad because we didn't have gear. But then the next day when was we worse, broke camp, worse that was wind. pretty sketchy. Yeah. Taking on a lot of water, splashing over the, the top. And just feeling like you could capsize with all that gear. We made that, that back pretty good, too. Yeah. Do you think two trips or one? Two. No, we did do one. Yeah, I think, yeah. We good. did one and we took everything all at the same we didn't have, time. We didn't, the last trip we did was a light, lighter load. It felt like we were paddling through like wet cement <laughs> with all that gear. It was really fun though. Oh man. Yeah, that was a real adventure. Um, I'm looking for, forward to something a little more tame with this beagle hunt. And that though. channel that we were camped in uh, has never ending mackerel supply. Always <laughs> mackerel in there. Apparently. <laughs> <laughs> Always mackerel in there. Yeah, we just kept cat jigging up mackerel. Yeah, that was great. That's so cool. That was really cool. Yeah, you know, I, I think that the mackerel just get, they're so underrated. I mean, I understand they're not this like incredible game fish to fight, of course. And I also, and I'm talking about Atlantic mackerel, you know, the 9 to 12 inch long mackerel. Um, they don't taste bad at all. Yeah, I know. They're not the... They're not the greatest culinary fish, of course, but like they're not as bad as people make them out to be. I really like to fillet them and freeze them. All those fish that we um, caught last time, Ken and I had a dinner of them, and uh, there was like one fish in the whole batch. I was like, oh, that was a little fishy. And those probably, sat in the cooler probably, for days. Yeah, though. and they were still good. But there was probably just one that I didn't take the bloodline out of right. Oh, okay. You know? yeah. and, and they were still like really neutral tasting. Okay? That's it. Neutral, a little bit of... You know, it's almost like if you think of fish as, ha- if, as being sort of like white meat and dark meat of chicken. Yeah, they're, you know, they're like a, meat. definitely a dark meat. Yeah. But um, once you cut that midline out and then you have the bellies and the loins, oh, they're so good. Mm-hmm. Salt it up real yeah. nice and get the skin a little crispy. Yeah. And I like it because it's like a miniature tuna. So you're getting all of, well, it is a miniature tuna. So you're getting all of those DHA benefits um, and EPA benefits, those 
like really long chain delicate lipids that are in, are the, in the fish omega-3s that are, people talk yeah about. but they're not the alpha linolenic acid they're the um I, deoxy something 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 dha and epa so those are like two two fats that are subcategorized under the omega-3s but they're the long chain omega-3s and those are the ones that are really important because you can have really high omega-3 intake and not have good dha oh. you know like i remember i was talking to a woman recently who um is friends with your mom and pat um and she stopped me at the post office recently and she was telling me a story about how she had gone to get her lipid profiles done in her blood work and they were saying to her listen your your dha levels are really low and she's like yeah but i'm like doing chia seeds and flax seeds and she had all these omega-3 foods and they were like yeah but that's not translating because you your body will take uh omega-3 fat um i just want to make sure it's alpha because there's alpha linoleic acid and alpha linolenic acid let me just see which i want to make sure i'm not saying that wrong yeah, ALA, alpha linolenic. So um, she she had high alpha linolenic acid intake, but they were saying, listen, you need like animal based um, omega threes because plant based omega threes don't have DHA or EPA, mm. and so if you're somebody who poorly converts those substances over or can't convert them over, you'll have low DHA levels, which is the fat primarily found in your brain. So you can imagine how important that is. Um, and this is, I think, also a really important thing for, for women who um, are having children or plan to have children or have had children to think about, too, mm-hmm. because, you know, your body goes like, hey, um, I need to build a brain here. And if there's no good DHA coming in through the diet, it's like, all right, uh, we're going to pull off the bank account up in your skull here. And, mm. and uh, your brain starts to become your kid's brain. And so you need to feed that to yourself, to your kid, restore your own you know, to restore your cognitive function, essentially. I like, that's why I like that idea of rotating your game meets like night by night. Yeah. You know? Well, that said, like with the, um, cause I love eating white fish. So when we're eating haddock or something, it's great, but it's might as well be fat free, mm-hmm. you know, cause there's like, well, like, what if you keep the skin on those? Do those, does that have, if you were to scrape, under the skin but the problem is it's like this the fat on a haddock is all wound through the midline Mm. so you got to eat that midline of the fish which is that part that typically is not so flavorful to Mm -hmm. eat but yeah you get you definitely get some from that like when i bake a haddock for sure i'm going to eat a lot of that fat but it's not like i mean come on you take a mackerel or a tuna it's dripping yeah dripping something like a swordfish super high high yeah, it's like marbled in a swordfish kind yeah, of. Yeah, there's a lot of oil in those swordfish, huh? Yeah. Yeah. Well, and here's the th- way to think about it, or here's one way to think about it. If you weren't warm blooded, and you had to become the ambient temperature of the ocean, mm-hmm. or maybe you're like a tuna, so you're super unique and you're a couple degrees warmer than the ocean, but you're basically that temperature. Mm-hmm. Your body fat, which right now, when you squeeze it and play with it, and it's like a jelloey. Mm-hmm. that stuff would get the way bacon looks when you pull it out of the fridge. Right. But once you heat up bacon, all that fat turns liquidy. Yeah. When we're at body temperature, because we're alive, our fat's pretty liquidy. It's like a gel. Mm. But when we die, it hardens up. So you look at the deer hanging on a gambrel and the fat looks all solid. But of course, it's not solid when the deer's alive. Yeah. It's cooled down. So fish living in the ocean, if they had stearic acid, let's say, like a saturated fat as their body fat, they would just float to the surface because their fat would become like a wax and they mm. would you know, be all hard, like mm-hmm. coconut oil in the fridge or something. Yeah. So they have to have a fat that's super, super polyunsaturated because those fats stay liquid when they get cold. Mm-hmm. And so I always used to illustrate this by having people imagine like, okay, say you have a bottle of coconut oil or lard and you it's a hundred degrees in the room. Like that's the liquid. Yep. Let it get down to with coconut oil. I think around 70 degrees, it starts to gel and then turn solid. Um, now olive oil at room temperature, or even when it starts to get cold, Still stays a liquidy. liquid, put it in the fridge. It might get, turn a gel, but yeah. it doesn't turn solid till you freeze it. Yep. So, um, that's a mono unsaturated fat. But then a polyunsaturated fat, like a seed oil. So yeah. olive oil is different. That's um, oleic acid. But when you get into the seed oils, 
those oils that we've learned are like usually not really good for us. Those seed oils, um, when you get those cold, like if you take flax oil and you put that in the freezer, it stays a liquid. Does it? Yeah. And so that's what's up with DHA, EPAs. Those are polyunsaturated fats so that the fish can maintain like a liquidy body fat yeah. so that they don't freeze and up that's in the pretty, sea. that's unique to fish? No. For, uh, let me think. As for an animal, I mean? No, because it's going to be in the brains of... Uh, other animals and in the nervous system because you're but we I, don't like to eat brains no but i believe you're <laughs> you must you, you're certainly getting some particularly from um grass-fed animals are going to be higher in it it's going to be because also when you take a, a little bit of fat out of something like if you took like if we took a cross section of your love handle let's whoa, say whoa, whoa. or mine <laughs> and we nutritionally analyzed it i just didn't like the way you looked at it when you said it <laughs> <laughs> Yeah. <laughs> go ahead. Go ahead. Uh, if we took a cross section of your adipose tissue, yeah. um, each of your cells that that's a fat cell has got like a big oil drop, and that oil is going to be composed of many different um, lipids. So there'll be some saturated fats and some polyunsaturated fats, mm -hmm. and you know, so that's kind of interesting. So that it's like it's not like it's just one thing yeah. that's in an you know in a oil. An oil is going to be composed of. That's why you can take something like coconut oil can be broken up and fractionated into like MCT, MCT oils, yeah. you know, and then the MCTs always like plural because it's a bunch of different oils. Yeah. So you can get all these different caprylic acid and butyric acid and all these different yeah. um, lipids out of this what appears to be one type of oil. So, right. um, but anyway, that, I just think that's interesting to think about. Like that uh, on land, you can have a saturated fat as your as your body fat because you're warm blooded for one um and two because you know you you just don't have to the fear of turning solid like a candle <laughs> <laughs> yeah. yeah that's what you need to think about but anyway so back to your what you were just saying about um alternating what you're eating yeah i feel like the mackerel tuna swordfish complex of species that we've been eating what else fits in there do you think like anchovy, sardines, or oily. Right. You know, around here in our fisheries, it's a lot of white fish. It's like haddock, pollock, the um, uh, even, halibut. Yeah, I was going to say even something like a halibut. Yeah, it's a white fish. So, you know, we have a lot of those. And I like, I could eat that pretty regularly, like once or twice a week. That's no problem for me. I don't get sick of that. But I don't think I would eat tuna swordfish or mackerel like multiple times like that's like a once a week fish for me yeah or i'll start to feel like a little nauseated thinking about them and i also wouldn't eat like tuna one night and swordfish the next night i mean i might if i was on vacation in a place that's got a really good fishery or something yeah. but but uh or if i'm eating it raw so like uh when we were in hawaii it was pretty easy to eat poke every day yeah it was but if and it was because like a when in rome type of thing yeah that's yeah that's a big part of it but um yeah, like oily fish is like, you know, once, maybe twice a week I can eat that. But it's probably pretty important to have in your diet. But it is, yeah. Like, what do, you, what do you think about people who take, like, fish oil pills? Like, yeah. no, I'm not asking what you think of those people. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> like, do you think eating an oily fish once a week will do the same type of thing? Yeah, I think it could, yeah. But, um, and I think the biggest concern with fish oils, you know, I've been doing nutritional supplements for... 15 years and yeah. I've been in that industry and I've wanted to for a, by the way, I am freaking pumped about the black walnut protein. I'm too. I was so excited about that. Um, but we'll come back to that. But a, um, I've always wanted to do a fish oil, but there's a lot of issues because yeah, I could imagine there's issues with, so, well, before we even get to there, their sourcing is a huge part. You're like, is this ethically sourced? And then you're like, oh, this is some pretty murky territory when you start to try to figure out. Murky waters. It's murky waters. Um, then the rancidity is the biggest part. So those oils, so the, that's the other thing. So we were talking about saturated fats being like at room temperature, a solid. Those are such stable fats. That's why you can cook at high heat with them. Um, they're just really, really stable. When you start to get into something like a monounsaturated fat, like oleic acid and olive oil, most people know like, hey, you can cook with that, but you don't want to fry in that. Mm. The high heats denature the fat in such a way that those become almost like polymerized and kind of toxic to you. But with 
polyunsaturated fats like seed oils or and in particular seed oils are one thing they're they're pretty unstable but then dha and epa the fish oils they're even more unstable so uh, you could you'll see fish oil two ways it'll be in a refrigerated section or it'll be nitrogen flushed because you know 78 percent of our atmosphere like the air you and i are breathing right now 78 percent of it's nitrogen okay but it's inert it's an inert gas so it's two i think nitrogen gas is a, is two nitrogen molecules together and you just breathe it in and breathe it out and it doesn't do anything it's just like in and out hmm. you're you're trying to pull off that little bit of oxygen that's in there i think it's like what is it 16 percent maybe oh i'm so rusty on this there's like 0.5 percent carbon dioxide and then there's some noble gases and stuff that make up the mixture of air we breathe but nitrogen essentially moves in and out of you with like, it doesn't react with things. Mm -hmm. So like oxygen reacts with everything. That's how you end up with rust or things oxidize, right? Things go bad because oxygen reacts with um, essentially like steals electrons from things. But nitrogen doesn't do anything to anything. That's why you need plants that can fix nitrogen to the soil because you need nitrogen to produce protein, to produce tissue, but the nitrogen in the air isn't usable unless you have something like a bacteria that can fix it to the soil so plants can actually get access to it. So then we can get access to it by eating the plants or eating the animals that ate the plants. Mm. So you need nitrogen, you just can't use the gas effectively. Um, so nitrogen just moves in and out of us. But if you compress it, breathe it as compressed air in a tank. Yeah, right? man. Now, under the pressure of all the water on top, yeah, like a whip, <laughs> like whippets of nitrogen. But like when you're doing scuba, for instance, and now you're breathing nitrogen that's compressed, but then you're being compressed by all that water. That allows nitrogen to get into your blood, mm. and then if you surface too quickly, that's what the bends is, right? Right. So that's the, the decompression sickness. All of a sudden, all this nitrogen that you've gotten into your blood, which normally doesn't get into your blood, Expands. starts to like turn back into a gas comes out of solution and bubbles into you basically like percolates up into you. So anyway, why am I talking about nitrogen? So what they'll do with, yeah. So what they'll do with fish oil though, yeah. to keep it stable. Like if you see like a bottle of cod liver oil on a shelf, mm -hmm. that should be going rancid. But what they do is they blow nitrogen through it and purge all the oxygen out. So it's nitrogen flushed and then seal it so that there's no oxygen in the container, but still light destroys it. So, and, and I, I believe with those oils, they oxidize a thousand times faster in the presence of light than they do in the dark. So oxygen, light, and heat are the thing that, that destroy those fats and make them rancid. So fish oils are really unstable. That means you need to, so if you want to be really, if you want to do really, really good in the industry with fish oil, you need like, that means refrigerated trucks and refrigeration for the product, which creates a lot of overhead. Right or you need really good nitrogen flushing, but then it's like, then it's on the customer to get it home and be really careful with the mm -hmm. oil. Um, and you'll see a lot of it in capsules. I don't know how, if they can nitrogen flush cap. I don't know how they do the capsules, how they keep that oil from being rancid. I'm not sure about that, but anyway, so I love the idea of fish oils as a supplement, but I'm not entirely sure. I, I looked at one point, I was looking at doing it with green lipped mussels out of New Zealand. That was like one approach I was looking at. I looked at a few different really obscure fisheries and then I thought about, actually, I, I've gotten as far as having product samples created, like formulating, but just never brought anything to market because I'm worried it'll be rancid. Seems uh, like the, to, to have that quality control along the whole chain of production would be a little bit difficult. Not just production, yeah. but all the way to the shelf. Yeah. But at yeah. least, I mean, you have the warehouse. You'd you would even have to have a refrigerated. Oh, yeah. We'd need to have, you know, yeah. a walk-in cooler to keep it and all that. So then you start getting, that's a pretty specialized gig. So you've yeah. got this, that handful of companies that are in that game. And some of them are, seem to do a really good job of it. And others, you're like, you know, like somebody who goes to Walmart and buys like some really low end. Yeah, is it hurting them? It's almost probably worse for them than not taking it. Most of that fat's going to be rancid. Right. Same thing on you. I don't really see how you could open a can of sardines and, or, you know, canned mackerel or something and think like, oh yeah, these fats are still intact. Maybe there's like, maybe it's like some percentage is intact, you know, like maybe like 12% of the fat's still good and the rest is rancid or something. But when you start, those, what about when we can those halibut, not halibut, those, um, herring, what are, what, what are yeah, alewives. Al I wouldn't, that's, that's I wouldn't like another one of those fish. Yeah. That's an, that's like another great example of an oily fish. Um, eels too, huh? Yeah. I wouldn't, um, 
I wouldn't eat a canned fish thinking I'm getting my DHA needs met. You'd be like, I made it edible. Yeah, I've <laughs> made this edible. <laughs> I've made it edible and stable for a little while. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. but I think this is... Everybody, <laughs> there's this line in the Bible that says like, uh, to work out your salvation with fear and trembling. It's like an individual game, like working out your salvation. It's like nutrition's like that. It's mm. like... It's like, man, there, it gets to this point so easy. Having been a nutrition guru in a past life, you know, like a, a lot of my career, um, I, I got out of that world because you start realizing that people are just saying things. <laughs> I was just going to say, it doesn't take, it takes a little bit of charisma and some facts like yeah, it might may or may not be yeah. true. You're doing to make quotations you, with your fingers when you say me, that. Yeah, to make me think like, oh, of course, I got to yeah. be doing this. Yes, that's and then it. again, I, I I go like, I ebb and flow with that so much with things. I'll be like, no, I don't like need. Uh, and like, if you did what everybody said, like, let's say you were like, I'm gonna do what <laughs> Jordan Peterson says, and I'm gonna do what Jocko says, and I'm gonna do what Joe Rogan's protocol, and I'm gonna do like, you know, you start taking on all of these like high level podcaster guys. Tim Ferriss's protocols and before you know it your life would be like unmanageable right you couldn't yeah you just can't do it and then is the juice worth the squeeze in a lot of those cases like when you start to try to stack all that stuff mm -hmm. that's how I ended up here going like I just want to hunt and fish I'm sick of like I'm sick of trying to do this through supplementation and stuff um you know I obviously do take supplements and I you know I think they play an important role but trying to find salvation through nutrition is a dangerous game I mm -hmm. think you know um what was it just reminded me of something I, about uh, this book I started today by uh, something Holiday. What's his name? Ryan? Yeah, Ryan Holiday, the stoic guy. Okay, cool. You know, and yeah. uh, the book is called uh, Ego is the Enemy. It was that he was just sort of talking about, and this is something I saw when I would public speak big events where there'd be a lot of public speakers and you'd get to spend some time with the public speakers and you'd sort of see behind the scenes what a mess everybody is. Mm. And that's the challenge. So he starts off the book talking about, um, there's like a quote in there about, essentially, like if I was going to paraphrase it, it's like the person who's giving you like good advice and comfort about life can only do that because their own life is a train wreck. Mm. And then they know like what to say to you. Yeah. You know? <laughs> yeah. Uh, and how it would be short-sighted to think, oh, that person's got their life together. And so we're so easily fooled. And it's, I don't mean it like we're fooled convinced. in the sense of, um, yeah, we're so easily convinced, but I don't mean that in the sense that the people who are convincing us are trying to be malevolent or anything right. like that. It's just the number of people that I've spent time with who are like, oh, you're like a regular guy. And it's like, yeah, I was <laughs> what, relieved. What, <laughs> what did you, what, I'm probably more regular than you think. Um, so yeah, I think a lot of times it seems like it's maybe it's like the, like, it's like the Budweiser commercial that you used to see all the time where it'd be like, the guys are partying and there's all these girls in bikinis in the pool and like and Budweiser, Budweiser, it's like as if the product creates the lifestyle. Mm -hmm. And I think people see a lifestyle that they want. Like, I want to be like that influencer. And then it's like, what are they doing? What are they eating? And then before you know it, you're like, what's their sleep protocol? What's mm -hmm. their morning routine like? And you're like trying to like do all of these things as if that's going to bring you to that person's status or something. I think that's just a bit of a mistake. I so. think it can be helpful to like look at all that stuff yeah, of what too. the people that you... Um, like appreciate and the people that you look up to, look at what they do in their life and then you got to filter it out and you got to yeah. see what makes sense for you. Obviously. It's just sometimes helpful to think like, I wonder how many times they go pee pee and poo poo. <laughs> and when their clothes are done, like what are they like when they're doing their laundry or their taxes or like, like remembering that these are people who have like all of the same human flaws and trappings and you know, they're experiencing the human condition like you are. Like they also woke up one day in a biological spacesuit trying to figure out where the owner's manual was, mm -hmm. you know? And I, I mean, obviously I, I deeply believe in looking at what other people are doing and trying to, you know, uh, piece together like a sane way of living. I mean, I think that's yeah. really smart to do, but I think the, the challenge is, is how easily we, can get ourselves in over our head where we're like trying to do all these different practices and our, yeah. our actual life isn't going well as a result of it. Mm -hmm. So 
that led me to want to spend this time doing this particular thing, like just focusing in on the food piece and connecting in with nature and with non-human species because I got just like really sick of the human species <laughs> for a minute <laughs> for, from, from being around so many gurus, you know? Yeah. But, you know, whatever. <laughs> <laughs> but how, when you say the ego, his book is called The Ego is the Enemy? Mm-hmm. That's one so, of his books. And then like, how would you define uh, ego in that sense? It's like, okay, I haven't, I'm just, I started the book this morning, so yeah. I'm not going to speak for Mr. Holiday and how he's writing about it. But um, I had this martial arts teacher who always said, uh, oh, your ego is the guy on your license. Mm-hmm. It's like the guy you think you, it's like the story that you've created about who you are. That's like part of it. And then part of it is, because it's easy for it to sound like it's a bad thing. Um, actually, let me, let me backtrack a little bit. Sometimes when we hear ego, we think like somebody's attitude or something like, Oh, that guy's got a lot of ego. And I don't mean that, that, more that's like a, how you that touches on it. That's a piece of it. Yeah. But, but it's more like when you, it's like, who are you when no one's around and it's just you alone? That's like a very authentic integrated form of yourself. Mm-hmm. And then a second person comes in the room and now there's your ego your ego pops up. It's like the character you step into to represent yourself. And yeah. Like and it's how like, you identify in the world. Correct. Yeah. That's what's so dangerous about identity politics is you're, that's literally like ego politics, you know? So, or a lot of it is. So when you are around another person, now you're trying to be the person you've built yourself up to be with your stories and your experiences and, um, that part of ourselves just gets really out of control I feel like sometimes. Even um, if you're like a super shy person, I feel like that's your ego out of check too. You know, because it, like a, a lot of people think that like, like if you have a huge ego, like you're boisterous and like loud and obnoxious. But if you're like scared of what people think of you, yeah, yeah, that's also yeah, your ego's ego. out of check. I do think, just as a clarifying point, I think there are introverts and extroverts naturally. Yeah, of course. But that said, yeah, I agree. Yeah. And then you're going to carry like all your wounds and mm-hmm. you're going to carry all your pain and you're going to carry all your successes and all that stuff becomes your ego, you know? Yeah. Like, um, here's a great example of ego as somebody who lived as a really long time as a vegan and a vegetarian. I can remember now when I stopped, I started to eat meat again. I remember really struggling with my identity because it was like, I had put so much stake in myself as that ism, Mm -hmm. I identified with it. I had like, I had lost myself in the identity. And then when I gave up that identity, I was like lost as a person. And that's really sad. Yeah. Cause it's like, you should know who you are regardless of like what you eat. Right. Um, like you are more than just your diet, but that was my ego, not me. That wasn't the authentic me. That was my ego was really caught up in that. Yeah. You know, so that's like, I'm, I find this stuff like we have to be so careful because for instance, like I'm a hunter. There'd be another good example. It's like, I'm a hunter, but that's not my whole story. And I don't want to ever be so identified with that, that I, I lose touch with myself as like a, a more holistic entity. Right. Cause that's just like one small slice of a pie of what I am. Mm -hmm. But then again, like I only need to say I'm a hunter because I'm around other people. So when there's no other people around, I don't like go around like trying to tell (laughs) the the trees in the clouds that I'm a hunter. You know what I mean? That's like, it's ego. It's like, you know, so anyway, it's uh, not like you want to dissolve the ego completely either. It's like, I don't think you could function without it. It's like, yeah, like you gotta just use it. It's plays an important role. I think that's another mistake is taking that too far. Like ego dissolution. It's like, well, you, you need it to pilot yourself through life. Right. You don't want to just be like on the top of a mountain the rest of your life. Right. Like sitting cross-legged. <laughs> Not doing it. Yeah. All alone. all alone. Yeah. I don't think so. But I think you just want to be a more integrated person. Hey, you watched that movie recently. Um, Inside Out. Inside Out. Yeah. That touches on a lot of this it stuff too. Great. Huh? Yeah. It's like a fun way to look at look at what's going on inside your head internal how family your, dynamics look at, cool. yeah and look at in, internal family dynamics that's the name of the psychological system that all within yourself yeah like yeah. there's a like the idea is that there's a family inside okay. you, like an internal family yeah. like because like uh 
you're all these parts is the idea. Because, man, my emotions can really control who I am, you know? Yeah. Like, when I get, if I get in an argument with my partner and I'm mad, it's like, there's no, <laughs> there's no, like, I, there's no reasoning, you know? Mm -hmm. Sometimes. And then even if I do know it logistically, I'm like, no. I'm not going to say, I'm not going to go hold her hand. <laughs> um, I, 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 there's so much here. Obviously we're just about out of time, but I want to dig into this a little <laughs> bit, but uh, to touch on what you're just saying right there, something I've been noticing at my gym. So at this CrossFit gym, I go to, oh, I knew it. I knew he was going to bring it up. Okay. It's a cult. Okay. <laughs> um, we'll be given our workout and uh, there's all these little whiteboards, like little, yep. they must be like, I don't know, 12 inch little whiteboards. So you grab a whiteboard and you write out your stuff on it. And um, sometimes it'll be like, uh, okay, you're going to do your first lift at 80% of your max. And then you're going to do your next lift at 85% of your max. And the next, so there's math. Or it just might be like you have, you've got to do 150 box jumps and like 40 burpees. But after a while, you start losing track of them. Yeah. And the higher your heart rate gets, the more the math center of your brain just stops working mm. altogether. Mm -hmm. I'll be sitting there sometime. I'll feel like part of my brain is missing because I'll be trying to add, just let the weight on the plates, the, the weight world. of the plates on the bar. <laughs> and I won't be able to do the math, right? Because my heart rate's up. Mm -hmm. Similarly, like if you look at uh, how people function under stress, particularly with fine motor skill and decision-making, if you don't have a lot of training and practice, mm -hmm. most people are pretty bad at performing under stress. So similarly, like when you get angry like that, your heart rate goes up, your blood pressure goes up, right? You spike adrenaline and now your rational reasoning centers of your brain that would normally be like, hey, saying this would be stupid, Grant, don't say this. All that's just gone, right? And we just start to do like make really bad decisions that are based purely on uh, not just emotion, but on that particular moment's emotion, you yeah. know, like just everything on a whim. Um, yeah, that's some dangerous territory right there. Yeah, you got to be careful in those moments. Yeah, like it's a lifelong pursuit of learning how to like tame that part of yourself, but also controlling yourself physiologically. Because, you know, today you, you, you and I were looking at heart rates for, uh, um, output from workouts mm -hmm. and you we were talking about how quickly you recover back to a resting heart yeah because i had noticed intervals. i had noticed that your heart rate went down a lot further Faster. than mine further than mine in the same a lot of time period. yeah yeah um just because i've i've got a you know a few extra months on you in the cardio stuff so so the faster I can get back to a resting heart rate, the faster I have my rational brain comes back mm. online yeah, that's a cool way so to look interesting at it. way to think about it yeah. and this really applies to hunting because mm -hmm. what's buck fever? Right. You start to hear your heartbeat in your ears and you feel it in your neck and your fingers are pulsing. The animal's right there. Everything's like super nervous. And you're like, stop being able to think yeah. properly. <laughs> that happened to me the other day. I heard a deer coming in and uh, everything you just said happened to me. And I was like, oh, well, how am I going to do that? Like, how, how am I, I don't know how to shoot. You know? <laughs> and then, of course, I saw a gray squirrel run up the tree. <laughs> and I was like, ah, <laughs> I wish I liked 22. Um, it was a squirrel the whole time. If you go out thinking, like, let's say you have a holdover. Like, you're like, okay, my gun sighted to 100. I know at 200 yards, I need to hold, you know, this high or whatever. And then an animal walks in at 200 yards. Unless you've got a lot of experience, if you're new and you're trying to do something like that, mm -hmm. it's like out the window. You're just going to put the crosshairs on whatever and shoot because you, you're not thinking math in those. All that goes away, yeah. you know? So this idea of learning to control your heart rate, to control your emotions so that you can make rational decisions actually applies to hunting tremendously. And I think it's what all new hunters wrestle with as they go through the buck fever stage, working towards... I mean, that's what, you know, the, our, our Hawaii episode number one is about, is about me just screwing up because i'm excited i've been traveling i'm in this exotic place my heart rate's jacking up there's animals everywhere and i'm like trying to shoot and i'm doing terribly because i'm not in control because i'm too adrenalized and i've let my heart rate get too high and and grant a big part of crossfit <laughs> <laughs> when you join the cult is learning to control your heart rate uh, wow, there's a lot to talk about here. So, hey, um, before we go, I just wanted to say one other thing, uh, which is that you and I have been, and Jesse have been batting around the idea of uh, creating a new podcast where we can delve into more topics because 
so we're about a hundred and s- what? How far? How many episodes? One sixty-two. This will be, I think. Yeah. Or depending on when it comes out. It's pretty cool. You know, the other day I was give, giving that talk at MMA, and I met a woman that was, uh, I think, the sixth. Not Matt, but saw a woman there who was like our sixth interview. Who's that? Um, the woman who did the psychology work, and we went to MMA. Um, we did a seaweed episode with her. Mullins. Yes, Jesse Mullins. Mullins. So Jesse was like, oh, wow, that's so cool to see how many episodes you guys have done because I was like one of the first people you interviewed. And uh, anyway, so here we are this deep in, um, but obviously we run into moments like this where we're, we're getting way outside of the <laughs> content of what this show has been about, which is Wild Foods. Yeah. So we're talking about starting a new show potentially that would give us a lot more room to um, talk to different types of people, um, to talk about different topics outside of just food stuff. So I'd just be curious, like for people listening to this who are interested in that, you know, we're going to, there'll be a post associated with this um, podcast on social media everywhere. So uh, comment there if you're interested in that. Uh, my last podcast was Rewild Yourself and did probably about the same number of episodes there. Um, and that also had kind of a limited, there was bookends on it. It was like, I'm talking about issues surrounding human wildness and then came into this podcast with m- even more focused, like we're going to talk just wild foods. Um, but uh, it would be fun to do a show that didn't have any bookends on it at all. Right. And we could just explore any it's, topics. Sometimes we'll get to a thousand feet and I'll feel like we need to bring it back. Yeah. Yeah. make it relevant again. And, so and I'm, yeah, I'm curious to see how, what that would be like to not have to yeah. come back down. What kind of feedback we, we get on that. Yeah. So, so yeah, let us know if you're interested in uh, shows outside of just um, the wild food uh, space, because um, while we have quite a extensive um, a network of folks, especially from the last show that I did, you know, talked to a lot of psychologists. Mm-hmm. I talked to, man, I did everything. I was talking psychology, death, sex, birth, like all, just all kinds of topics, fitness, exercise. Um, food of course all those things so yeah i think it'd be fun to explore some more of that content so if you're interested in that let me know by you know either dming me or or writing on our uh our posts associated with this podcast but do you want to talk about before we go about the black walnut powder a little bit yeah well i mean i gotta go because grant i gotta get myself to crossfit here (laughs) um but yeah the black walnut protein um i just you know i've been talking about at the beginning of the show and the ad but it's just like Having been 15 years, 16 years in the supplement space, I've just never encountered a product this clean. Um, We had, of course, you always get like negatives from people. So I had somebody saying the other day, they were like, well, why why not just eat the nuts? It's like, well, I'll introduce you to the people who own a company that have been producing and shelling those nuts for 75 years and no one's eating them. So turning them into a, because by making this protein powder, we're making black walnuts a relevant food where there, here's this tree, wild, from North America, producing fruit every year that falls on the ground that would otherwise not get eaten. And by turning it into a protein powder, it becomes a relevant food for yeah. modern people who can now eat this wild food um, that otherwise would not eat a wild food. Mm-hmm. Um, and they, they're just simply not going to eat the nuts because the flavor of the nuts is weird. So they're just not going to eat them. So it was like, this person said that. And I was like, I get where you're coming from. Yeah. Like, why not eat the whole you, food? Yeah, if you're going to eat... It's like, how many black walnuts have you eaten this year or in your life? Like, probably none. So, um, you know, to me, to take this wild food and then CO2 extract it, so you have this ultra clean, raw extraction of the protein fraction of it. Man, it's pretty awesome. <laughs> so yeah. I'm pretty excited Especially about it. Especially if you're talking to somebody that's going to use protein powder already. Yeah, that's it's it. It's like, it's hard to find something so unique and clean yeah and then for it to be a wild food that's what i mean and then to know that the the workforce of foragers are volunteers who are paid by the pound we met a lot of those people that was cool you know and they're just like everyday people just regular people who are like making a few extra bucks by picking up black walnuts and selling them um yeah so the fact that you've got like a really uh ethical labor force you've got the most ethical food i can think of it's like a wild native crop it's a tree so it's perennial and it takes up it not only does it not take any habitat because it's not planted it's not orchards so you're not monocropping you're not even cropping it's just there and then not only are you not taking habitat the way like if you had a rice protein or a hemp protein or something you're like take away habitat to grow that right this is already there and it is habitat right so it's like you're investing in wild habitat and out of that, you're getting this wild food. 
that instead of being like, you know, harvested by underpaid migrant workers, it's like Americans who pick it up off the ground and sell it into the marketplace to get some extra money. Like the the guy that we worked with who, uh, he was getting hired. Ex- yeah. He was getting hunting equipment for his kids. Yeah, for the, yeah. the nuts they picked up, he was buying the archery gear. Right. So it's just so cool. Um, and then the fact that out of that, you can get a protein powder mm-hmm. that's ultra clean and high in protein. You know, black walnuts are the highest protein of any tree nut. Really? At least of any of the commercial tree nuts. I mean, maybe there's another tree nut in the world, but, but not, not you know, as far as like almonds and cashews. What do you get? 18 grams of serving? 17 grams right. of serving. Um, yeah, so like that, the whole piece is just really exciting. But also, I get to work with Hammonds, who's yeah, 75 years of you know in the wild food business. So that's pretty great. cool, and yeah. they're just awesome people. So family-owned business. I'm like, yeah, I'm really proud of uh, this product, man. I mean, I think there's I a think lot of potential for it. I think it could be pretty groundbreaking. Yeah, I think I'm it really is. excited about it, it is. for you guys. Well, thank you for bringing it up. Yeah, appreciate that. Um, I know you just want another bag of it, but <laughs> <laughs> it makes me feel good. <laughs> Um, I'm excited too, to show people, um, Hammond's operation in, uh, season three of the TV show too, too. because we went out and made an episode with them and not about the protein powder, but just about their operation working with the black walnuts and, uh, and, uh, yeah, it's pretty awesome. So cool. Well, uh, Grant, always fun to sit down with you like this, man. Yeah, you too. Um, see you at CrossFit. Sometime. Yeah. Not tonight. Like when though? (laughs) Specifically when? All right. It was great uh, talking to everybody and, uh, we'll see you next time. (laughs) Thanks for listening to the Wild Fed Podcast. You can help us grow this show by subscribing and leaving us a rating and review. It ensures better rankings and more advertiser interest, which translates directly into better shows, more awesome guests, and a constant stream of fresh new content. Have a podcast guest or topic suggestion, or maybe a hunting, fishing, or foraging trip you'd like to host the Wild Fed TV show for? Email us at info at wild fed. If you still haven't seen season one or two of the Wild Fed TV show, go to MyOutdoorTV.com, grab yourself a free trial subscription, and then check out all 20 episodes. Season three of Wild Fed premieres on Outdoor Channel in early 2023. And be sure to visit our website, Wild-Fed.com, to check out our store for Wild Fed shirts, hoodies, hats, stickers, and more. Wild Fed. Food is all around you.